Today we will continue reading The Most Dangerous Game by Richard Connell. And this is part three. We will begin on page 62. If you remember on page 61, we read that General Zaroff tells Rainsford that he stocks his island with big game to hunt. So Rainsford says, what have you imported, General? Tigers? The general smiled. No, he said. Hunting tigers ceased to interest me some years ago. I exhausted their possibilities, you see. No thrill left in tigers. No real danger. I live for danger, Mr. Rainsford. The general took from his pocket a gold cigarette case and offered his guest a long black cigarette with a silver tip. It was perfumed and gave off a smell like incense. We will have some capital hunting, you and I, said the general. I shall be most glad to have your society. But what game, began Rainsford. I'll tell you, said the general. You'll be amused, I know. I think I may say, in all modesty, that I have done a rare thing. I have invented a new sensation. May I pour you another glass of port, Mr. Rainsford? Thank you, General. The General filled both glasses and said, God makes some men poets. Some he makes kings, some beggars. Me, he made a hunter. My hand was made for the trigger, my father said. He was a very rich man with a quarter of a million acres in the Crimea and he was an ardent spokes sportsman. When I was only five years old, he gave me a little gun, specially made in Mo Moscow for me, to shoot sparrows with. When I shot some of his prized turkeys with it, he did not punish me. He complimented me on my marksmanship. I killed my first bear in the Caucasus when I was 10. My whole life has been one prolonged hunt. I went into the army. It was expected of Noblebun's sons and for a time commanded a division of Cossack cavalry. But my real interest was always the hunt. I have hunted every kind of game in every land. It would be impossible for me to tell you how many animals I have killed. The general puffed at a cigarette. After the debacle in Russia, I left the country, for it was imprudent for an officer of the Tsar to stay there. Many noble Russians lost everything. I, luckily, had invested heavily in American securities, so I shall never have to open a tea room in Monte Carlo or drive a taxi in Paris. Naturally, I continue to hunt grizzlies in your Rockies, crocodiles in the Ganges, rhinoceroses in East Africa. It was in Africa that the Cape Buffalo hit me and laid me up for six months. As soon as I recovered, I started for the Amazon to hunt jaguars, for I had heard they were unusually cunning. They weren't. The Cossack side. There were no match at all for a hunter with his wits about him and a high-powered rifle. I was bitterly disappointed. I was lying in my tent with a splitting headache one night when a terrible thought pushed its way into my mind. Hunting was beginning to bore me, and hunting, remember, had been my life. I have heard that in America, businessmen often go to pieces when they give up the business that has been their life. Yes, that's so, said Rainsford. The general smiled. I had no wish to go to pieces, he said. I must do something. Now, mine is an analytical mind, Mr. Rainsford. Doubtless that is why I enjoy the problems of the chase. No doubt, General Zaroff. So, continued the general, I asked myself why the hunt no longer fascinated me. 
You are much younger than I am, Mr. Rainsford, and have not hunted as much, but you perhaps can guess the answer. What was it? Simply this. Hunting had ceased to be what you call a sporting proposition. It had become too easy. I always got my quarry, always. There is no greater bore than perfection. The general lit a fresh cigarette. No animal had a chance with me anymore. That is no boast. It is a mathematical certainty. The animal had nothing but his, his legs and his instinct. Instinct is no match for reason. When I thought of this, it was a tragic moment for me, I can tell you. Rainsford leaned across the table, absorbed in what his host was saying. It came to me as an inspiration what I must do, the general went on, and that was, the general smiled the quiet smile of one who has faced an obstacle and surmounted it with success. I had to invent a new animal to hunt, he said. A new animal? You're joking. Not at all, said the general. I never joke about hunting. I needed a new animal. I found one. So I bought this island, built this house, and here I do my hunting. The island is perfect for my purposes. There are jungles with a maze of trails in them, hills, swamps. But the animal, General Zaroff, oh, said the general, it supplies me with the most exciting hunting in the world. No other hunting compares with it for an instant. Every day I hunt and I never grow bored now for I have a quarry with which I can match my wits. Rainsford's bewilderment showed in his face. I wanted the ideal animal to hunt, explained the general. So I said, what are the attributes of an ideal quarry? And the answer was, of course, it must have courage, cunning, and above all, it must be able to reason. But no animal can reason, objected Rainsford. My dear fellow, said the general, there is one that can. But you can't mean, gasped Rainsford, and why not? I can't believe you are serious, General Zaroff. This is a grisly joke. Why should I not be serious? I am speaking of hunting. Hunting? Good God, General Zaroff, what you speak of is murder. The general laughed with entire good nature. He regarded Rainsford quizzically. I refuse to believe that so modern and civilized a young man as you seem to harbor romantic ideas about the value of human life. Surely your experiences in the war did not make me condone cold-blooded murder, finished Rainsford stiffly. Laughter shook the general. How extraordinarily droll you are, he said. One does not expect nowadays to find a young man of the educated class, even in America, with such a naive, and if I may say so, mid-Victorian point of view. It's like finding a snuff box in a limousine. Ah, oh, well, doubtless you had Puritan ancestors. So many Americans appear to have had. I'll wager you'll forget your notions when you go hunting with me. You've a genuine new thrill in store for you, Mr. Rainsford. Thank you. I'm, not a, I'm a hunter, not a murderer. Dear me, said the general, quite unruffled. Again, that unpleasant word. But I think I can show you that your scruples are quite ill-founded. Yes, life is for the strong, to be lived by the strong, and if needs be, taken by the strong. The weak of the world were, were put here to give the strong pleasure. I am strong. Why should I not use my gifts? If I wish to hunt, why should I not? I hunt the scum of the earth. 
sailors from tramp ships, Lascars, blacks, Chinese, whites, mongrels. A thoroughbred horse or hound is worth more than a score of them. But they are men, said Rainsford hotly. Precisely, said the general. That is why I use them. It gives me pleasure. They can reason after a fashion, so they are dangerous. But where do you get them? The general's left eyelid fluttered down in a wink. This island is called Ship Trap, he answered. Sometimes an angry god of the high seas sends them to me. Sometimes when providence is not so kind, I help Providence a bit. Come to the window with me. Rainsford went to the window and looked out toward the sea. Watch out there, exclaimed the general, pointing into the night. Rainsford's eyes saw only blackness. And then, as the general pressed a button, far out to sea, Rainsford saw the flash of lights. The general chuckered. They indicate a channel, he said, where there's none. Giant rocks with razor edges crouch like a sea monster with wide open jaws. They can crush a ship as easily as I crush this nut. He dropped a walnut on the hardwood floor and brought his heel grinding down on it. Oh yes, he said casually, as if in answer to a question. I have electricity. We try to be civilized here. Civilized? And you shoot down men? A trace of anger was in the general's black eyes, but it was there for but a second, and he said in his most pleasant manner, Dear me, what a righteous young man you are. I assure you, I do not do the thing you suggest. That would be barbarous. I treat these visitors with every consideration. They get plenty of good food and exercise. They get into splendid, splendid physical condition. You shall see for yourself tomorrow. What do you mean? We'll visit my training school, smiled the general. It's in the cellar. I have about a dozen pupils down there now. They're from the Spanish bark, San Lucar that had the bad luck to go on the rocks out there. A very inferior, inferior lot, I regret to say. Poor specimens and more accustomed to the deck than to the jungle. He raised his hand and Ivan, who served as waiter, brought thick Turkish coffee. Rainsford, with an effort, held his tongue in cheek. It's a game, you see pursued the general blandly. I suggest to one of them that we go hunting. I give him a supply of food and an excellent hunting knife. I give him three hours start. I am to follow armed only with a pistol of the smallest caliber and range. If my quarry eludes me for three whole days, he wins the game. If I find him, the general smiled, he loses. All right, that's going to conclude part three of the most dangerous game. Continue working on your worksheets.